Well, you can uh, officially say that you know you have a pushy pastor because I push this over every time. Okay, well, if that one didn't get you, maybe this one will. Like as Pastor Ralph was, uh, was sharing, you know, how the Bible gives us imagery of uh, how, how a, oh. <laughs> amen and amen and amen again. <laughs> so as the Bible gives us imagery, as Pastor Ralph was, uh, was uh, pointing out, of like a mother hen. Uh, putting out her putting out our wings and that we can hide under the pinion feathers Str- strange little factoid um, so the pinions are the are the uh, the feathers right on the very very end and some birds uh, some birds it's very difficult to tell them apart from each other the crow and the raven uh, to be to be exact and uh, believe it or not so the, the 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 quickest way to tell the difference between a big crow and a raven is that a uh, is that a crow will have four pinion feathers whereas the raven has five so the difference between a raven and the crow is really the matter of opinion. Ah, uh, uh, so so you can so you can see, you, I know, right? Like, you guys could have stopped this. You saw it coming. There was, <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, that avalanche is really just rolling this way, isn't it? I, whatever could I do to get out of the way? Turn his mic off. So, you know, it is, you know, the, the, the whole thing with Jumanji, it does, it resonates with me a little bit, because it is, it's a, word, it's a weird year. I kept checking here to see how many lives I have left. But the problem is, you know, <clears throat> I, 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 I really think of myself as The Rock, but I'm pretty sure everyone else thinks of me as Jack Black. Um, so, you know, this, this year, as we're, as I'm going to stop there, um, <laughs> So this year, this year is, I don't thank you, Phyllis. God bless you. This year is a challenge. And it just, have you ever, have you ever just uh, uh, gotten, gotten smacked one way and turned around and get smacked the other way? And, 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 and I don't, and I don't want to be too intense with it, but, but the year has been intense for, for a lot of us. Um, and there's scarcity out there. I, I don't know. I don't know who feels that right now. Everyone's situation is very, very different. Uh, uh, is anybody feeling scarce as far as relationships right now? Really hard to connect. What about scarcity as far as provision? You know, has, has your job, your business, your, your, your savings been impacted? You know, scarcity as far as health, like scarcity as far as peace. Like just this past week, we had a couple dear families in the church that were secondarily concerned that they might have been exposed. And all of a sudden, their worlds shut down for a moment. Again. Here we are again. We're back into it. And then, and then you're, 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 you're put into this place where, I mean, like, I don't want to bring up old wounds, but toilet paper. Right? Like, let's go back. Let's go back to April and the great TP shortage. I promise you, in 10 years from now, this will be one of our stories. So, good news is I could eat. I had lots of food. But the bad news was I didn't have any TP, so I couldn't eat. So it's not until you're kind of in a tight spot that you recognize how quickly we begin to desire or covet. Really, I mean, I am sorry, I never felt so stupid in my life as deeply desiring toilet paper. I just, I really, I was like, where am I going to get it? How can I get it? Can I, maybe I'll get some from, maybe I'll get some from the other work. Maybe I'll go and just take a roll and just, (laughs) I'll bring one back later. It'll be okay. You know, but, but what other things have you done this with? Where have you felt this scarcity in your life? I remember uh, years, years ago when I used to work for Coca-Cola and I was, I was, you know, 19, 20 years old, you know, you, 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 you eat sugar and meat all day long. You sleep three hours. You don't feel anything. And on a regular basis, I was working 14-hour 14, 14 days. 
physical labor days. And you know, like, that's okay every once in a while. But when that just kind of starts to be consistent, all of a sudden it's, it's 10 hour days, five days a week, 12 hour days, five days a week, 14 hour days, five days a week, 12 hour days, six days a week. Hey, how you going? And you get home and you're physically exhausted. You are just spent. You're, you're 20 years old. Things shouldn't hurt. And they hurt. And I remember because my time was so scarce. I remember just, just desperately being tired and climbing into bed. And instead of going to sleep, I turned on late night TV. I was like, I just want to watch David Letterman. I haven't got anything I wanted to do today. I didn't get to do any of it because my time was so scarce. I so desired, I coveted this silly thing. In scarcity, we covet. In fear, we begin to seek control. Is that fair? Is that fair? I mean, I don't know what silly things you did if you were, if you were uh, you know, paying attention when we went from 1999 to 2000. Do you remember those days? <laughs> embedded <laughs> chips! Oh, I don't know that flavor. What's an embedded chip? That sounds delicious. No, it, <laughs> what, we didn't even know what they were. But then we feared them, and we feared them deeply. And then we began to hoard things. Oh, I'm going to get some cash on hand. I'm going to get some ammo on hand. I'm going to get some extra food. Freeze-dried. I've never had freeze-dried food in my life, but now it seems to make sense. We begin to get a little bit silly when we covet, and, and we covet when things are scarce. And so I thought, I thought it would be an interesting journey for us to go on uh, this week to take a quick trip into the Ten Commandments take a quick trip into the Ten Commandments. Um, and, and we're out of order because instead of starting with the first commandment, we're going to dive right into the Tenth Commandment. But to give a little bit of context, we're just going to read through them together. Is that okay? We're going to dive on in. So if you turn in your Bibles with me, uh, you, can, you can find the, the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I love that he didn't start with a rule, he started with relationship. Let's just identify who I am right now. This is who is giving you an idea of some boundaries, of some parameters, of things that you should be aware of. Remember how you were locked in slavery and somebody let you out? That was me. That's what God's saying. That was me. I am the Lord, your God. Let's look back together. Plagues that you were protected from. Me, pillars of fire, pillars of smoke. Me, Red Sea parting. This guy, God was making it very clear, calling to mind his provision, his investment into these people. This was not an overseas despot trying to exercise authority, calling in an airstrike, never being on the ground. This is, this is our with you God. The same with you God who is with us now. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Who's so glad for that second part? Who's so glad for that second part? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Always remember, holy is dedicated to God. That's holy. Perfect's a hard standard. Holy is dedicated to God. Your very best. You bring it to God. You're intentional with it. That's holy. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner, traveler, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You ever wonder how the children of Israel really reacted to this? Think about being slave labor. Slave labor, hard put to slave labor. Would they have immediately recoiled at the notion of somebody telling them how to spend their day off? Has anybody ever messed with your day off? I tell you what, sometimes I put a month into a week. And my last day off, I snuck yard work in. We were just talking about this. And I was so delighted, I guess it's a sickness, I was so delighted to get it all done on what may have been the last sunny Monday of all time. <laughs> I snuck it. We're not promised tomorrow, people. I promise it's not going to be for six months, right? You know, so I got it in there, right? But, but there's always something else pulling on. I'm like, no, I've got plans. I've got to get this done. I'm not doing it in the rain. The grass is already this high. i got mushrooms with fairies building homes underneath of them. <laughs> got to get to it. You get the little, the, oh, they were big, aren't they? Yeah, whoever walked up to one of those and thought, think I'll eat it. This is a terrible idea. I don't know who started this. I'm glad they're delicious, but I was not going to be the first guy. I'll tell you that. But what? Somebody was messing with their day off. All of a sudden, they're introduced to this notion of a day off, and then immediately somebody's messing with it. Would they hear it like that, or do you think they would have heard, a day off? I get a day off? Isn't it funny, the human heart? Both of those resonate with me. Which one would I have been? Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land, and that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not go into politics. No, this is, well, it's kind of the next one, right? You know, it's kind of... You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning, very, very frightening, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. I just want to point out the stupidest thing ever said. Don't let God do that, Moses. Hey, Human being, would you control God for me? I wonder if they... Heard, have you ever said something and then just kind of left it, just watched it leave your mouth and hang there and go, yeah, it didn't work. Shouldn't have said that. That, that makes no sense at all. That makes no sense at all. On any level, God who had proven himself to be strong and good and kind and invested but also mighty. And they closed, I guess, one eye and only chose to see one part. 
Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you. And that fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. And the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Boy, the people missed the point. But we find there, do not covet. Do not covet. You know, when we are, when we are looking in that, at that list of ten, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin the sermon by going to the end, and then we're going to do the middle, and we're going to do the end again. But it's important, it's important to me that, that we all draw nearer to God with an understanding of the things of God. So in an effort for that, do you know when we're looking at that list of ten, you know, idolatry, murder, adultery, slander, like, just, just do the list. Go through the list in your head. Can you do any of those without first coveting? Can you really do any of those without first in your heart desiring something more than obedience to God? Because when we go through the Bible, and we're going to hit a bunch of different scriptures that hopefully will inform us, covetousness, this, this out-of-order love is almost idolatry. To, to bring loves out of order are, is almost idolatry. You know, when I'm, when I'm saying out of order, which is what I titled the message today, I'm actually going back to St. Augustine. You know, Augustine lived a long, long time ago. And in one of his books, Confessions, he was, he, was, uh, he was expounding, he was talking about how he would define sin. Because Augustine didn't come to faith until he was an adult, right? And he was reading Cicero, who was a Greek philosopher, lots of good stuff, right? And Cicero was saying, you know, people really don't start off wanting to be unhappy. And yet, we sure end up that way. The great majority of people on the planet are miserable, on some level. How? How does this happen? What happens? And so Augustine's looking at it, and, it, and you know, as he's defining sin, and I love looking at, how, looking at how people with a deep love for God and significant wisdom will define something like that. Because can I tell you just the list of nine things plus one there in the Ten Commandments doesn't really satisfy me when I'm thinking about how to live a life that's free from sin. Does it satisfy you? Like, if you, if you kept those, if you kept just those, do you think you'd, do you think you'd be okay? Do you, think, do you think that'd be good? Here, let's, just real fast, let's, let's fast forward. Let's go, uh, let's go to somebody who did. In the Gospel of Mark, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him, and he said, Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, All of these I have kept since I was a boy who's got two thumbs and wants a gold star that guy Jesus looked on him and loved him and he said one thing you lack go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come and follow me and at this the man's face fell he went away sad because he had great wealth and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So when we're looking at that list, can I tell you, can I tell you that that list, though significant and helpful, is inadequate to actually satisfy what it means to live a life well. Is that okay? Somebody, somebody told me one time, and I just love it, that, that the law, the commandments, are meant to be like a mirror. 
I come to the commandments and I see the reality of how I am. Well, uh, this week it looks like I'm uh, 5 for 10. I'm 5 for 10 this week. A little bit of room for improvement, but I'll wait to see the curve. Okay, next week, 7 out of 10. 7 out of 10. Uh, the, 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 the following week, 0 for 10. Yeah, sorry, I had to kill a couple people. Didn't work out. So, but it's a mirror. The commandments, the law, serve as a mirror to show us the condition of our hearts. But a mirror never washed a dirty face. A mirror never cleaned a soiled hand. So whereas the law, the commandments are like a mirror, the gospel is like a wash basin. Because it's not enough for me to be told my condition. Because if I'm going to be honest in my heart, I probably already knew. It's no good for somebody to come along and say, hey, Mark, you're to this, you're not enough that. You're lacking. You're insufficient. It didn't work. You don't measure up. You're a buzzkill, Tony. All right, don't tell me that. But if somebody comes along and says, friend, let me help bind your wounds. Let me help cleanse your hands. There's a place at the table for you. I don't need to focus on where there was dirt. Let's work towards healing together. This is the gospel of Christ. So when we're looking, when we're looking at that list of commandments, important, but not enough. Because who can keep them all? Who can keep them all? So Augustine, Augustine reading Cicero, talking about how people want to be happy. They start off being happy. Every culture in the world, they know the rules, and every culture in the world has a hard time following them. The rules that that culture writes themselves. They make their own rules, and then they can't keep them. We make our own rules. You know citizens made up speed limit? Who here's broke the speed limit? It's on video, right? So you'll either be a criminal or a liar. You'll be one of the two. You know, when I was searching, when I was searching a theological topic the other day, and just this, just this extensive list just, just popped up, all these good resources, da, 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 da. and I thought, my problem is not the problem of, of somebody in North Korea who has no access to a Bible. I've got access to wisdom. I've got access to knowledge. It's at my fingertips. But something inside of me doesn't seek it out. So when we're looking at those first nine commandments, you, you can't really do any of the nine without first coveting, without wanting your neighbor's possessions more than he deserves them, so you take them. His spouse, so you take them. His life or his property, so you take them. That, that when you're looking at maintaining your word, you're put into a tight enough spot, a tight enough spot that though you thought you were an honest person, I wouldn't ever lie, I wouldn't ever, I wouldn't ever do that. These are good people that are around me. I wouldn't treat them poorly. How did that happen? Can I tell you? Because it's the same for all of us. Augustine talks about out of order loves. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that in a couple different ways because I like words. Contronyms are sometimes fun, you know, one word with two meanings. Like, for example, uh, let's do trim. If you're going to trim something. All right, well, if I'm going to trim something and I'm a meat cutter, I'm cutting off fat. But if I'm a trim something and it's Christmas, I'm hanging garland. One, I'm adding things to. The other one, I'm taking things away. Same word. So when we're talking about out of order, let's first, let's first talk about it how Constantine, how Constantine, Augustine. Constantine was a different guy. So how Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, meant it in this. Essentially, essentially, it's not that we start off loving bad things. 
I mean, who gets up in the morning and is like, well, you know, it's, uh, it's 70, 70 degrees outside, a few clouds rolling by, tulips are up, uh, my neighbor is singing a song, I see a hummingbird, uh, it's time for some mass destruction. Nobody, nobody, starts, off, nobody starts off doing this. But, but we find ourselves loving things out of order. It's good and right to say love, I don't know, to, to love a root beer float. I love a good root beer float, especially living overseas where you couldn't get root beer. Oh, what a treat that was. You know, the taste of it sends me back to childhood. Delicious. And then I also love my wife. You've met her. She's clearly the better half. But I don't love Kate the same way that I love the root beer float. If every year in May I celebrated the first root beer float I ever had and made a commitment to, <laughs> this would be weird even for me because there's a right order there. I love food. I love a good movie. I love my family. I love God. In the exact opposite order. In the exact opposite order. So when we're talking about out of order loves, it's simply that we've taken something that was good and we've elevated it to that which would be divine. We've made a good thing into God. And there was a psychologist, a Christian psychologist, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but he said, if you want to identify what's an idol in your life, and this is a downer, imagine your nightmare. Imagine the thing that if you lost it, it would devastate you completely. Not that it would make you sad for a while, not that it would ruin the week, not that it would be hard to get over, that would absolutely ruin you and leave you without hope, in deep despair. If this thing was removed from your life that you would lose meaning and significance, this thing is an out-of-order love, this thing is an idol. You covet it. Is it your work? Is your identity, is your out-of-order love looking at what you do with your hands, with your mind, with your time? Does it bring you significance in your community? Does it bring the income that you so rely on and ultimately trust in? Does it make you feel good about yourself when all the other things around you don't? Maybe it's an idol. Is it your free time? When you are trapped in a job that you don't like, maybe you're not getting along with your family, and all that you can think about is getting out on the jet ski. That's what you live for. That's your whole week. Nothing else matters. Nothing else brings you joy. I've just, oh, this, this life has lost everything to me. If I could flip a switch, everything else would drop out, and I would be on the jet ski, and that's all I would do. Well, then the moment that you lose that job, or that the jet ski sinks, or your family. And I'm sorry, this won't be popular. But if you love your family more than you love God, this is an issue that God has addressed. You, if, if, if you lost your favorite person, or can I say it differently? And I want to be sensitive. When you lose your favorite person, or when your favorite person loses you, because this is unavoidable. At that point, will you lose who you are? Will you say, God clearly can't exist because this relationship that I held most dear 
has been taken away. I hate sermons like this. Why did I start this? This is hard. Let's talk about joy. Let's go to Philippians. No, I can't do it. We're here. Out of order loves. Can I tell you that God is down with root beer floats? God is in favor of a loving relationship. God is in favor of you doing something meaningful with your time, providing for your family, feeling good about yourself with the gifts and talents that he's given you. He's, 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 he's on board. More than on board, kind of his idea, all of it. But Moses, don't, don't, don't let God talk to us. We're fine with just you. We're, we're, we're going to be good with just you. We just, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do anything that's going to make me uncomfortable. I, I, don't, I don't really want to, to really do faith. You know, G.K. Chesterton, what a mind. G.K. Chesterton, one of C.S. Lewis's favorites, he wrote one time that it's not that people have tried Christianity and found it wanting, it's that they found it difficult and left it untried. You ever taken six pills from a 10-day supply of antibiotics? Seemed to work at first. And then when everything came back and it came back worse, you're like, that's it, I don't believe in antibiotics. Antibiotics, you're a lie. But friend, you, you did three quarters of antibiotics. That's, that's not what's your physician. Maybe he's a good physician. See how I'm tying this in, right? That's not what, that's not what, what, that's not what the wise person that you, that you went to for help actually said was how to do it. You did it your own way, and it went, went poorly. Something was out of order there. So when we're talking about properly ordered love, properly ordered love, I'm going to share just a couple, couple scriptures with you if I could. So... Just to start right off, in Genesis, we read in Genesis 4, verse 7, where we're talking about Cain and Abel, and there was some deep desire, because so, that covetousness, it's, it's, it is, it's a deep desire. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you, you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the, at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And I don't want to stretch it too thin, but we need to rule over, we need to rule over desires in our lives too. We need to order things properly. Like if I got up in the morning and I was like, okay, got to get dressed. And all of a sudden, I go out to the car, and I got my socks on on the overside of my shoes, right? You know, the undies are on the other side of the jeans. I, everything's on, but it's out of order. It's in the wrong order. I'm not accomplishing. I've got the, I've got the waterproof stuff on. I got my Gore-Tex jacket on under my undershirt. Well, that jacket didn't do a good job. I'm soaking wet. Friend, you've got it backwards. You've got it backwards to have things in order, to have our loves properly ordered. Also means, now check this out, also means if God is as intended your ultimate love, because let's be frank, He's the only thing that's not going to die on you, the only thing that's not going to go wrong on you, the only thing that it's true all the way to the core. If God remains your ultimate desire, not only does He not withhold good things from you, hear that? God puts wings on flies, He doesn't pull them off flies. Then if something else is taken from you, 
you cannot be destroyed. So when you lose your job, because you'll lose it at some point, when you lose your health, because you'll lose it at some point, when you lose your money, you'll lose it at some point, when you lose these things, it wasn't the ultimate KO finishing move fatality to you. Because this world is not your home. And you've hid your treasure, your treasure somewhere that it's safe. So, looking at, looking in, uh, looking in Matthew, Jesus, Jesus reassuring people when the hard times come. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. Gee, like when you read in the Bible and it talks about the church being the bride of Christ. You know, when you're, when you're getting married, you are saying, I am committing to this person my whole life and no other. To this person, I'm making a commitment from this spot, moving forward, this is it. And so is she. I've got it in writing, no backsies. It's mutual. And look at this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Do you know in the same way that God asks you to put Him before you, He put you before Him? At the cost of His very life? He said, well, if we're going to do this, let's do this. But this is how it works. This is the only way that it works. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Skip ahead a little bit. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross, that is a visible expression of death saying, no, I'm going to die at some point. I'm not holding on to this life like it's the end of the world because I know what's on the other end of the world. I know farther up and farther in where I'm going. Whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That is a properly ordered love. God, I will let you mess up everything else in my house to do this first. You know, because things have to be in the right order. For example, to make it kind of just very, very applicable, I don't know, who's, so I'll do, I'll do, I'll, I'll do something for all the lady mechanics out there and all for the gentlemen bakers. All the lady mechanics and the gentlemen bakers, right? So I do both, right? So I remember I used to have a 69 Mustang, and I was, I was a shade tree mechanic on it, which means I broke stuff. And I remember taking out the distributor one time. Took that distributor out, thought I had everything good, put it right back in, went to fire it up. Boom. Because I had it in backwards. I had it out of order. And when things start to fire, they were firing in the wrong way. I don't know what damage I could have done. Could I have cracked a block doing that? I don't know. Maybe. It wasn't good. Whatever it is. But it didn't work. So now here's where I'm going to play with words a little bit, right? So I went from being out of order, wrong sequence, to being out of order, it didn't work. Do you know doing things out of sequence, doing things three-quarters of the way, almost loving somebody, 
almost finishing your college degree, almost putting the engine together right, that doing these things leads to not a marriage, not a college degree, not a working vehicle. Out of order, it doesn't work. Have you ever, when you're baking, put things together in the wrong order? I remember when I was first making biscuits, because I do like a good biscuit. All hail gluten. We like you gluten. No, I know, I know it's not good for me. But you ever tried before you sift all the things together? I was like, oh, okay, so what are, what are the big ingredients here? Okay, I need flour, I need eggs, I need baking soda, I need salt. Okay, cool. So we'll do the flour and then the eggs. All right, so let me just mix in this uh, salt and this baking soda. I don't like those biscuits. I don't like those biscuits at all, Sam. I won't eat them with green eggs and ham. Not happening. They're terrible. It's out of order. It doesn't work. I did it in the wrong sequence, and it didn't work. Is your faith not working right now? Are you trying it three quarters of the way? Are you trying to put God high on your list, but not actually at the top of your list? The rich young man. Jesus, all these things I've done, I've totally kept these things in line. I got it. We're good. Okay. So I need you to do this one more. I need you to let go of control. I need you to stop desiring to be in control. This is, this is out of order. I need you instead to trust in me. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. Paul talks about this in Romans 7 because he was, he, he, was, he was that same guy. He had it dialed, a Pharisee among Pharisees, according to legalistic righteousness, faultless. But he says he looks at it and he said, oh, what a wretched man I am. The thing that I hate to do, I keep on doing. Ah, what am I going to do? You got to quit going to the mirror. You got to go to the wash basin. You got to you got to recognize. Now here's now here's where I'm gonna here's where I'm gonna. This is what I want us to get to. Right? Is that I can't commit any of the sins that are the Ten Commandments without first committing covetousness, which is the last of the Ten Commandments. But do you know I can't keep any of the commandments without first obeying the greatest commandment? Hear that again. I can't do wrong without first coveting inside my heart, having things out of order. But I can't do right without following the greatest commandment, which is love the Lord your God with just every fiber of your being. And any of those fibers that aren't getting into line, talk to God about it. Then it becomes his problem. <laughs> Look at that, you deferred. And then your neighbor is yourself. Your loves in the right order yield right results. Your loves in the wrong order yield bad biscuits, engines that don't turn. Have you ever really needed something? I mean needed something, like been so, so very parched and gone up to the vending machine, and you're like, oh, there's going to be a Gatorade in there. I'm going to die. Totally going to die. Only Gatorade can save me. Oh, I got 75 cents. That's just perfect. That's it. Out of order. Have you ever really needed to go to the bathroom? I mean, really needed to go. Like food poisoning needed to go. It hits you like a firestorm. And you're like, ooh. Out of order. So more than you needed undeniable physical things satisfied. More than you needed those. You have spiritual things that need to be satisfied. Because your physicality, though it is essential right now, it is mortal. But your heart, your soul, your spirit goes on and on, on and on. And when you remember that first, then you've listened to the teachings of Christ and your loves are in order 
Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be willing to consider with me. Nadine, if I could invite you up. So in the book of James, in chapter 4, we read, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is not this that your passions, your, the things that you covet, are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly and spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And as we move on, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and He will exalt you. Colossians, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So this sounds very judgy for a minute. But I got to tell you, there's another type of desire that the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about angels that desire deeply to look into the gospel, into the promises that you have, because it's not wrong to desire deeply. It's just we need to desire the right things in the right order. Can, can, I, can I remind you that God understands how you were built. He understands your needs and desires. He understands when I'm scared, maybe I'll act out this way. When I'm angry, maybe I'll act out this way. And ultimately, we're all trying to satisfy the same things. We all want to be loved. We all want to be respected. We all want to be forgiven. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. We want these things. And we act out in lots of stupid ways. But do you know who loves you, knows you, and accepts you? Christ and he does it through the cross and the cross is never out of order the cross is never out of order so we come to him I don't care how long you've been following Christ you come to him and you recognize that I can have all of my deepest most deeply felt needs met if I will do things in the right order. But if I do them in the wrong order, if I do them in the wrong order, if I snatch love from somebody else, it doesn't satisfy. If I snatch belongings in an illicit manner, I steal. I never really, I never really am satisfied. But when I will come to Christ in the right way, I will allow His great work to work in me, to cleanse my hands, to cleanse my heart, to satisfy my needs. We're back in order. We're back in business. Nothing is so delightful when you're that rotten mechanic like I am and you turn the key and all of a sudden it starts back up. It stops being a lump of metal. When you take that last pill, that last antibiotic and you return to strength, 
when you, when you apologize to that person that you wronged and they forgive you and things are back in order again. God has an order for our lives and our hearts and it all must start with Him. And all that is good, He will hand back to you. And all that is not good for you, a good Father will withhold. And we should be thankful for both. Can we close our eyes and pray? So Lord, in this moment, in this moment, would you take away any of those things that we would be willing to let go of? Are you in this place today with, with just your eyes closed? You know, if you'd, if you'd just... If you just let me see some, something signifying that God's speaking to you right now, I want to pray for you specifically. I'm not going to make you get up or anything. But is God asking you to, to trust Him more today? Is God asking you to, to, to allow Him to simply reprioritize the way that you go about your day-to-day? -to, -day? to allow Him to be first? You know, there... There are other people lifting their hands. You're not alone. So, as, a, as an outward expression of something inward that's going on, would wherever you are, would you just lift your hands like this? Just open hands, just signifying that you're not wanting to clutch on to things. You know, Augustine said one other thing. He said inside his heart, he has a love that loves to do which is good, and he has a love to do that which is bad. And his only hope comes from a third love, a love that loves the love that does good and hates the love that does bad. And Lord, so are we today. Our heart knows what's best, but but boy, it's too hard for me to do on my own. I try to do things on my own, but really that just leads me to make a mess of things. Lord, I just want you to take over. I want you to restructure things, reorder things, to make, to make things right, to make things in order. I'm so thankful that you're a good God that we can trust, that you are the God that sought out those who were trapped in slavery that you are the God that sought out those who were trapped in sin. And that you made a way for both to move for, to freedom and life without limits. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would do so much more in people's hearts than is happening at this point in time. I pray that, that just, like, just like dough rises, that it starts small, but it grows into something significant and beautiful, Lord. I pray that that, that, this, that this germ of truth that we are talking about today, that it would lift all of us this week, that we would all rise in you to be the beautiful creation that you made us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So we're running a marathon. We were running a marathon before, we're running a double marathon now. Don't run a marathon dry. You know, you see those you see those marathon runners, they'll just throw a little cup of water into their into their mouth because you can't run a long time dry. Allow God to nourish you this week. Have a great week.